A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens Read by Mark Scoggins Stave One Marley's Ghost Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years. Ah, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone was old Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful will come from the story that I am about to relate. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on a foggy, cold, bleak, dark Christmas Eve, our story begins. Is it not enough I walk a snowstorm without beggars blocking my way? Out of my way, or I'll take a stick to you. Good afternoon, Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Cratchit, what are you doing with that shovel full of coal? It's barely cold, sir. I thought to warm the office. Burn one more piece of coal today, and you and I shall part company. Do you take my meaning, clerk? Yes, sir. Now, you get that letter from Higgins and Blackthorn, Cratchit. And then, I want you to finish posting this ledger. And after that, you can pop over to Parthagel's and tell Ethram Parthagel you've come after the seventeen shillings and sixpence he's owed me since Michaelmas. And then, tell him I shall have a constable over there if he doesn't pay up at once. Mr. Parthagel's wife has been ill, sir. What do I care about his wife? I want my seventeen and six. I just thought it being Christmas, sir. Christmas. Christmas. You mention that word to me once more, Bob Cratchit, and I'll... A Merry Christmas, Uncle! A Merry Christmas, Bob! Merry Christmas, Mr. Fred! God save you, Uncle! Yeah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? Now I'm sure you don't mean that. I mean just that. Exactly that. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you? you you're poor enough. Well... What right have you to be dismal, Uncle? You're rich enough. Brah. Now, Uncle, don't be cross. Well, what else can I be? I live in such a world of fools as this. What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? Why, if I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled in his own pudding and... Buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle, nephew, keep Christmas in your own way. Let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone, then. I still say Merry Christmas, Uncle. That's all you do say. Much good may Christmas do you. Much good has ever done you. There are many things from which I have derived good by which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good, and I say God bless it. Very well said, sir. Let me hear another sound out of you there, Bob Cratchit, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. As to you, nephew... You're quite a powerful speaker. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. You talk enough nonsense. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. Uncle, please, come dine with us tomorrow at my home. You. Why did you get married? Why did I get married? Because I fell in love. Love. Ha! <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm sorry you feel that way. Well, I tried. Merry Christmas to you, Bob, and the missus, and to Tiny Tim. 
And Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. And here's another one, my clerk. Fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family. Talking about a Merry Christmas. I retire to Bedlam. Cratchit, there's someone at the door. Go and see who it is. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Is this the firm of Scrooge and Marley? Yes, sir. We should like to see the head of the firm, if we may. Oh, very good, sir. What is it? These gentlemen to see you, Mr. Scrooge. What? Have we the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley is dead. He died seven years ago this very night. Well, now, Mr. Scrooge, at the season of the year, it's only fitting that we who are more fortunate should raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. You may not believe it, sir, but many thousands are now in want of common necessities. <sighs> and hundreds of thousands are in want of simplest comforts. Are there no prisons? What? Well, yes, there are plenty of prisons, sir. And the workhouses. They're still in operation, I trust? Yes. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then? Yes, both very busy, sir. Ah, I'm glad to hear it. I was afraid, from what you have said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their usual course. Uh, no, sir, uh, all these institutions that you mention are flourishing, but it's nevertheless true that some additional provision for the poor and the destitute must be made. A few of us upon change are endeavouring to raise such a fund, uh, you see, and, um, well, what should we put you down for? Nothing. Oh, I see. You, you wish to remain anonymous. I wish to be left alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas time, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments that take care of the poor. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. But they can't go there, sir. And many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, it's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, sirs. Gratchet, show these gentlemen out. Yes, sir. This way, sirs, please. Sir, I, I couldn't help overhearing. I should like to contribute tuppence. Cratchit! Yes, sir. It isn't much, but it's all I can afford. But there are others in worse situation than I. You're a generous fellow. I might say so of your employer. Cratchit! Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Cratchit! Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes, sir. Close the door. Yes, sir. Cratchit, what's the idea of snuffing out that candle? Well, it's getting late, sir. Oh, well, don't work too late. You might make something of yourself. Yes, sir, it, it's just, just that it's Christmas Eve, sir, and it's almost closing time. I suppose you'll want the entire day tomorrow. If it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. But I suppose I can't do anything about it. If I was to stop half a crown of your wages, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. Well, sir, I... Yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Well, see that you're here all the earlier the next morning. The clerk promised that he would and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Cornhill at the end of a lane of boys twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at blind man's bluff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home. He lived in a chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. 
It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also, that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then, let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge, as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled would be untrue, but he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, and walked in. He lighted his candle. He did pause with a moment's irresolution before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it, at first as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door, except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, nah, humbug. Up the staircase he went, trimming his candle along the way. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. At the top of the stairs, he reached his bedroom and closed the big heavy door behind him. He locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. He took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers, and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it. The fireplace was an old one, paved all around with quaint Dutch tiles. If each tile had been a blank at first, now there was a copy of old Marley's head on every one. Scrooge drew back deep into his chair. His glance happened upon a disused bell that hung high in the room. The bell began to swing. It rang out so softly at first that it could scarcely be heard. Then it rang out loudly. So did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bell ceased as they had begun. They were succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below. The cellar door flew open, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's a mug I, I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the big heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. <laughs> Scrooge looked the phantom through and through. He felt the chilling influence of his death, cold eyes. Uh, how now? What do you want with me? Mush. Who, who are you? Ask, Ask me, me who, who I, I was. was. All right. Uh, who were you then? In, In life, life, I, I was, was your, your partner, partner Jacob, Jacob Marley. Marley. <gasps> Can you sit down? I can. Do it, then. You don't, you don't believe, believe in me. me. I don't. What, what evidence, evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt, doubt your, your senses? senses? Because a, a, a little thing affects them. Slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be a bit of undigested beef, or, or a blot of mustard, 
or a crumb of cheese, a, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> Why, there's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling into a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round its head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped upon its breast. M mercy, dreadful aberration! What do you want with me? Man, Man of the worldly, worldly mind, mind, do you, you believe, believe in me, me or, or not? not? I, I do, I must. But, but why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me. And, and witness, witness what, what it cannot share, share but it might have shared on earth, and, and turn to happiness. Yeah, you're fettered. Tell me why. I, I wear the chain. chain. I, I forged in life. life. I, I made it, it link, link by link, link and, and yard by yard. yard. I girded it out, out of my own, own free will. will. And of my own free will, will I wore it. it. Is its pattern strange to you? Or would, or would you, you know, know the weight and length, length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was a fool, as heavy, and, and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago, you, you have laboured on it since. <sighs> It is, it is a, a ponderous chain. chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor, in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable. But he could see nothing. Jacob! Oh, Jacob Marley! Tell me more! Speak comfort to me, Jacob! I, I have, have none, none to give. give. It, comes it comes from, from other regions, regions of Anisa, Scrooge. And it's conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can, can I tell, I tell you, you what I would. would. A very, very little, little more is all permitted, permitted to me. I cannot I rest. rest. I cannot I stay. stay. I cannot I linger anywhere. My spirit, spirit never walked walk beyond, beyond our counting house. house. Mark, Mark me. me. In, In life, life, my spirit, spirit never rode beyond, beyond the narrow, narrow limits, limits of our money-changing hole. And where did journeys lie before me? You... You must have been very slow about it, Jacob. Slow? Well, seven years dead and traveling all the time. <laughs> the whole time. No rest, no, no peace, peace, incessant torture of remorse. remorse. You travel fast on the wings of the wind. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years. Oh, oh captive, captive, bound, bound in double iron. Not, Not to know, to know that, that any Christian, Christian spirit, spirit working kindly in this little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. <sighs> Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I. Oh, such was I. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business! And kind, kind was, was my business. business. The, the common, common welfare, welfare was, was my business. business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. business. The dealings of my trade, trade were but a drop of water in the, the comprehensive, comprehensive ocean of my business. <sighs> At this time of the rolling year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down? And never, never raised raise them, them to that, that blessed star, star which led the wise men to a poor abode, with there no homes to which its light would have conducted me. Hear me! My, my time, time is nearly gone. gone. Oh, I will, but, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob, pray. How, How is, is it that, that I appear before you in a shape that you can see? see? 
I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day trying to reach you. That is no light part of my penance. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Japanese air. You are always a good friend to me. Thank you. You, you will, will be haunted, haunted by three, three spirits. spirits. Is, is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It, it is. is. I, I, I think I'd rather not. Without, Without their, their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect, Expect the first, first tomorrow when the bell, bell tolls one. one. Couldn't I have them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Expect, Expect the, the second or the next, next night at the same hour, hour and, the and the third upon, upon the next night, night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that for your own sake, Ebenezer. You remember what has passed between us. Scrooge found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude, with its chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience, but as in surprise and fear. For on the raising of the hand, he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless taste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell, but they and their spirited voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. Being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed, without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. Stave Two, the first of three spirits. Scrooge awoke. He was lying on his bed fully dressed. Suddenly, the curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was upon the skin. The arms were long and muscular the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. 
Ebenezer Scrooge. Who, who's that? Ebenezer Scrooge. I have come for you. You? Are you... Are you, sir, the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am, I am that, that spirit. spirit. Who... Uh, what are you? I, I am the, the ghost, ghost of, of Christmas, Christmas past. past. Long past? No, no your past. past. But, but what do you want of me? What brings you here to haunt me? Your, your welfare. welfare. Rise, Rise and, and walk, walk with, with me. me. No, no, no. No, out that window? But... But, spirit, I am mortal and liable to fall. There, there but a but touch, touch of my hand here upon, upon your heart, heart and you, you shall, shall be upheld in more than this. Where are we? What's become of my room? And the city? And these trees? We're, we're in a forest. Where are we? Wait. These boys we see. I, I know them. I know every one of them. Why, we were schoolmates. These, These are, the are the shadows, shadows of the things, things that have been. They have, they have no, no consciousness, consciousness of us. Do you, you recognize this countryside? This countryside? Oh, I know every inch of it. Every rock, every tree. And that bleak building, building over there. Ah, that building. Yes, I was a boy there. I went to school in that horrible place. Do you, you recollect, recollect the path? Ha <laughs> ha! I could walk it blindfold. Strange, Strange you have forgotten forgot it for so, so many, many years. years. Come, Come, let us go closer. closer. Look, Look through the window in that cold, barren room. room. What, what do you, do you see, see, Ebenezer Scrooge? I see a boy. A solitary, a solitary child, child, neglected, neglected by, by his family, family. Alone. Yes. Yes, I see. I know that boy. <sighs> I was so lonely. Poor boy. Your lip is trembling, trembling, Scrooge. And what, and what is, is that, that upon your cheek? cheek? It's nothing. Nothing at all. I, I wish... Uh, it, it's too late now. What's, What's the, the matter? matter? Nothing. Nothing. There were waves at my door singing Christmas carols last night. And there was a boy like that among them. A poor, pale little thin boy in a ragged coat. I should like to have given him something, that's all. Come, Come Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge, let us see another, another Christmas. Christmas. Why, it's me again, but older now. Dear brother, I've come to bring you home. Home, little fan? Yes, home for good and all. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. He spoke so gently to me one night that I might ask if you should come home. And he said, yes, you should. And we are to be together all Christmas long and have the merriest of times. A gentle, a gentle spirit. spirit. Yes. She had a large heart. Yes. And, and died, died. A woman, a woman I, think. I think. And, and had, had a child. child. Yes. One child. True. True. Your, Your nephew. nephew. Come. Come. Do you Do know, know this, this place, place Ebenezer? Ebenezer? Know it? Know it? <laughs> Why, this is my counting house where I was apprenticed. It's my old master. Oh, bless his heart, old Fezziwig, my master, alive again. And hosting one of his glorious Christmas parties. Picture partners. Listen to him. Corkscrew, thread the needle and back to your places. And there's Dick Wilkins. Oh, poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yes, and look, there's Mrs. Fezziwig herself, looking younger than any of them. And the table's all loaded with roasts and cider, minced pie and beer. Oh, what a jolly time we used to have. That carefree young man, with a light heart and a smile. Do you recognize him? Yes. Yes. Merciful heaven, how happy I was then. A small, a small matter, matter for old Fezziwig to make those silly folks folk so full, full of joy. joy. Small? Small matter? <laughs> Indeed. Isn't, Isn't it? it? He has, he has spent, spent only a few, a few pounds, pounds of your mortal money. money. Is, that Is that so much, much that, that he deserves such, such praise? praise? It's not that. It's not that spirit. Old Fezziwig has the power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or heavy. His power lies in words, and looks, and in things so tiny that 
that it's impossible to count them. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost. What's, What's the, the matter? matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all, spirit. Something, Something I think. think. No, no. Speak. Speak. Well, only... It's just that I should be able to like to say a word or two to my clerk, Bob Cratchit, just now. That's all. My time, time grows short. short. Where are we now? Come. Come. This, this fair, fair young, young girl, girl by your side. side. Do you, you recognize, recognize her, her Ebenezer? Ebenezer? No. No, no. Please, spare me this. You're old enough. Now. A man in the, in the prime, prime of life. life. Your, your face, face has begun, begun to wear the signs, signs of care and avarice. Your, your eyes are greedy. The, the eager, restless eyes of a miser. No! No, please! She, she knows it too. too. That, that girl, girl by your side. side. There are tears in her eyes. It matters little to you. Very little. I know that. Belle, have, have I changed toward you? When we were engaged, we were both poor. Was it better, then? Better to be poor? Better, at least, to be happy. You've changed. You were another man, then. Oh, I was a boy. You blame me because I've grown wiser? Have I ever tried to break our engagement? In words? No. Never. In what, then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In everything that made my love of any value in your sight. So, I release you from your promise. Bell, when our engagement was made, we were young, poor, and content to be so. I was a dowerless girl, and you, who weigh everything by gain, if you were to seek me out now, would you be content? Ah, no, Ebenezer, I release you. Oh, at first it, it may cause you pain, a very brief pain, but soon it will be dim, like a half-remembered dream, an unprofitable dream, and you will be glad to be awake from such a dream. <laughs> May you be happy in the life you have chosen, Ebenezer, for the love of whom you once loved. That's enough. Show me no more. Take me home. These, These are, are shadows, shadows of things, things that, that have been, been, that they are what they are. are. Do not, not blame me. me. No, no more. No more. One, One shadow, shadow more. Come. Come. Spirit, spirit, I cannot bear any more. Leave me. Haunt me no more. Take me back. Take me back, spirit. Remove me from this place. I told, I told you, these were shadows, shadows of the things, things that, that have been, been, that they are, that they are. Do not, not blame me. Remove me. I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which some strange way there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him and he wrestled with it. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no longer! In the struggle, if that can be called a struggle, in which the ghost with no visible resistance on its own part was undisturbed by any effort of its adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright, and dimly connecting that with its influence over him, he seized the extinguisher cap that it held, and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it, so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further, of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed and he had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Stave Three, The Second of the Three Spirits
Awaking in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore, and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge, finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new specter would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands, and lying down again, established a sharp lookout all around the bed, for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance, and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently, when the bell struck one and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time he lay upon his bed, the very cord and center of a blaze of ruddy light, which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant. At last, however, he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence on further tracing it it seemed to shine. This idea, taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by name and bade him enter. Come in, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge! He obeyed. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor, to form a kind of throne, were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelve cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In an easy state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come, come in, come, come in, in. Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge, Scrooge come, come in, in and, and know me better, better man. man. Who, who? I am, am the, the ghost, ghost of Christmas, Christmas present. present. Look, Look upon me. me. You've, You've never, never seen, seen the like of, of me before. before. Oh, you're... You're different from the other spirit. You're, you're tall, almost a giant. And that great torch you carry, its, it's light, light pours, pours into the homes of rich, rich and, and poor alike. alike. Spirit, take me where you will. Last time I went against my will and learnt a lesson which is working now. If you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Well, touch, touch my, my robe, robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge. Touch, Touch my, my robe. robe. Where have you brought me, spirit? A, a humble, humble dwelling, dwelling in a, a humble, humble street. street. Oh, it's humble enough. Yet, Yet there, there is, is happiness, happiness here. here. Who, who are these people? Who's that woman and the children? These, these are, are the, the family of the, of the clerk, clerk Bob, Bob Cratchit. Cratchit. His, His wife, wife, dressed in a twice-turned twice gown, but brave in ribbons, ribbons laying the, the table, table for their Christmas, Christmas dinner. dinner. And, and there, there, assisting her, is, is her daughter, daughter Belinda, and the, and the young, young man with the fork in the stuffing, that's Master Peter Cratchit, and, and the two little Cratchits. Cratchits. Listen, Scrooge. Here's Martha, Mother. Martha! Why, bless my heart alive, Martha, my dear. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Mother. Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas. How late you are, my dear. Oh, we'd a deal of work to finish up last night and we had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind. So long as you're here now, sit ye down before the fire and have a warm Lord Blessy. Where's Father? 
He's been to church with Tiny Tim. They'll be along directly. How is Tiny Tim, Mother? Any better at all? Sometimes I think he is, and sometimes I'll think, Oh, dear God, if anything should happen to Tiny Tim. You mustn't think such things, Mother. Here they are. There's Tiny Tim. Merry Christmas, everybody. Martha, welcome, my dear. Merry Christmas, Father. And Tim, Merry Christmas, Martha. Oh, Tim, you darling. Oh, Father, I'm so glad to be home. And we're glad to have you, Martha. And how did little Tim behave in church, Bob? Oh, as good as gold and better. I like church, Mother. Oh, they sing the nicest songs. I hope people saw me. Saw you there? Why, little Tim? Well, don't you see? Because I'm lame. And if they saw my crutch, well, it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas who it was that made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Oh, bless you, my son. Are we ready to eat yet, Mother? Come on, let's eat. Yes, children, we're all ready. Come on, come, take your places. And Bob, you wait your turn. There's plenty. Stuffing and dressing and plum pudding for all of you. Martha, you take care of Tiny Tim. Yes, Mother. You see, they eat plenty. He must get tall and well. Now sit down. Sit down, everyone. Ah, oh, now, my dears, shall we say grace? Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I, I see, see a, a vacant, vacant seat, seat in the, the poor chimney, chimney corner, corner, and, and a crotch carefully, carefully preserved without an owner. Oh, no. No, no, kind spirit. Say he will be spared. Say he will live. If, if these shadows, shadows remain, remain unaltered, unaltered by, by the future, the future Ebenezer, Ebenezer, the, the child, child will die. And now, my dears, with such a dinner, a toast. A Merry Christmas to us all, and God bless us. Amen. God bless us, everyone. And now, I give you a toast to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. <gasps> the founder of the feast? <laughs> Indeed. Who pays you all but fifteen shillings a week? I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. Oh, my dear, the children. Christmas Day. Well... It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day? I'll drink his health for your sake, and the days, not for his. Long life for him, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Hope you'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. And I say, God bless him too, Mother, and everyone. There was nothing of high mark in all of this. They were not a handsome family, these Cratchits. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and had known very likely the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. When at last they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. Many calls Scrooge made that night with the ghost of Christmas present. Down among the miners they went, who labor in the bowels of the earth, and out to sea among the sailors at their watch, dark ghostly figures in their several stations. Much they saw, and far they went, and many places they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful. On foreign lands, and they were close at home, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door, and barred the spirit out. The spirit left his blessing. It was a long night, if it was only a night, and it was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind, and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss, whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while thus engaged, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it, as his own nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. <laughs> when Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, 
rolling his head and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions. Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, roared out lustily. <laughs> he said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live, and he believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred. He's a comical old fellow, that's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offences carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he is very rich, Fred. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear? His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of <laughs> that he's ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him. Oh, I have. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner. <laughs> After tea, they had some music. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, and played among other tunes a simple little air, which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more, and thought that if he could have listened to it often, years ago, he might have cultivated the kindness of life for his own happiness, with his own hands, without resorting to the sexton's spade that buried Jacob Marley. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favor that Scrooge begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guest departed. But the spirit said it could not be done. Here is a game! Only one half hour more, spirit! Only one! It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what, he only answering to their questions yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questions to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, a rather disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, the nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so inexcusably tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, a plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, "'Ha-ha! <laughs> I have found it out! I know what it is, Fred! I know what it is! Ha-ha! <laughs> what is it? It's your Uncle Scrooge! Ha-ha! <laughs> yes! Oh, he has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge.' A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge had become so light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an audible speech, if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off on the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain man, in his little brief authority, had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a very long night, if only it were a night. But Scrooge had his doubt of this, because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into the space of time they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, 
the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed his change, but never spoke of it, until they left a children's twelfth night party, when looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that its hair was gray. Are spirits' life so short? My, My life, life upon, upon this globe, globe is, is very, very brief. brief. It, it ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight, tonight. At, at midnight. midnight. Hark, the, the time, time is drawing, drawing near. near. Forgive me if, uh, if I am not justified in what I ask, but I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Uh, is it a foot or a claw? It, it might, might be a claw, for the, the flesh, flesh there is upon it. it. Oh, oh man, man, look, look here. here! From the foldings of its robe, it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. Oh, oh man, man, look, look here! here. Look, 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 look down, down here. here! They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meager, ragged. Scowling, wolfish, where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand, like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Scrooge started back appalled. Spirit, uh, are they yours? They are oh, man's, and, and they, they cling, cling to me appealing, appealing from, from their, their fathers. This, this boy is ignorant. This, this girl, girl is want. want. Beware, beware them both, and, and all of their degree, degree but, but most of all, beware this boy. For on his brow I, I see, see that, that written which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Have they no refuge or resource? Are there, Are there no, no prisons? prisons? And, and the workhouses, they're still, they're still in operation, in operation I, trust? I trust? The treadmill and, and the poor law are in full vigor then? <gasps> My own words. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. <laughs> Stave four, the last of the spirits. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the very air through which the spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible but one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night, and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. Am I in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come? Am I right in saying that you are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us? Is that so, spirit? Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company, and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? Lead on. The night is waning fast, and it's precious time to me. I know. Lead on, spirit. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. The ghost of the future brought Scrooge to a humble dwelling. They entered. Spirit, why have you brought me here again, here to Bob Cratchit's home? But it's not the same. Why is it so quiet? So very quiet. It's late. Past your father's time. He's walked slowly these past few evenings, mother. I've known him to walk very fast indeed with Tony Tim on his shoulder. 
but he was like to carry. And his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble. Father, you went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone with me. It would have done your art good to see how sweet and green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him. Yes. I promised him that I'd walk there every Sunday. <laughs> oh, my child. <laughs> oh, my little child. <laughs> Father, dear, please don't be grieved. <laughs> there. I'm all right. Thank you. I, I'm all right. I'm sure none of us will forget our poor tiny Tim. No, Father, never. That makes me happy. Very happy indeed. Oh, I love you all, my dears. Oh, that's cruel. Cruel, Spectre. Can't you give me one ray of hope that I may change all of that? That tiny Tim may live. Where are you taking me now? Here? On a common street spirit? What is here for me to learn? The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral for upon my life. I don't know anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. Oh, I don't mind going, if a lunch is provided. <laughs> Come to think of it, I'll bet I wasn't his best friend. What? We used to nod to each other when we met in the street. <laughs> <laughs> Spectre, help me. Who is this man that died? Is there no one to mourn this poor creature? No one to follow him to the grave? Perhaps they'll give him a green grave at least. Like poor Tiny Tim. Perhaps. Speakers and listeners strolled away and mixed with their groups. Scrooge looked towards the spirit for an explanation. The phantom glided on to a street. Scrooge looked about in that very place for his own image. But another man stood in his accustomed corner. And though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes. They left the busy scene, and went to an obscure part of town, where Scrooge had never been before, although he recognized its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, the people half-naked, drunk, slipshod, ugly, alleys and archways, like so many cesspools disgorged their offenses of smell and dirt and life upon the straggling streets, and the whole quarter reeked with crime with filth and misery. Far in this din of infamous resort, there was a low-browed beetling shop, the spectre porting towards the door. Scrooge understood and entered. Scrooge and the phantom came into the presence of a man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. You couldn't have met in a better place. Come into the parlor. Wait, stop while I shut the door of the shop. Ooh, how it squeaks. There ain't such a rusty bit of metal in the place as its own hinges, I believe. And I'm sure there's no such old bones here as mine. <laughs> <coughs> We're all suitable to our calling. Come into the parlor. Come into the parlor. The parlor was the space behind the screen of rags. The old man raked the fire together with an old stair rod, and having trimmed his smoking lamp, for it was night, with the stem of his pipe, put it in his mouth again. While he did this, the woman who threw her bundle on the floor and sat down in a flaunting manner on a stool, crossing her elbows on her knees, and looking with a bold defiance. Every person has a right to take care of himself. He always did. That's true indeed. No man more so. I then don't sit there staring as if he was afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed. <laughs> I should hope not. 
Very well, then. Who is the worse for the loss of a few things like these? If he wanted to keep them after he was dead, wickle old screw, why wasn't he natural in his life? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying, gasping out his last there, alone by himself. <laughs> if I could have laid me hands on anything else, open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak plain. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. Joe, having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out towels, a little wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. What do you call this? Bad curtains? Ah, bad curtains. You don't mean to say you took them down, rings and all, with them lying there? Yes, I do. Why not? <laughs> you were born to make your fortune, and you'll certainly do it. What's this? Is blankets? Who else you think? He's like to date cold without him, I dare say. Oh, I hope he didn't die of anything catching. Don't you be afraid of that. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. Ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They would have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What you call wasting of it? <laughs> Putting it on him to be buried in, for sure. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but all I took it off again. If calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it ain't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier in that than he did in that one. <laughs> Scrooge listened to the dialogue in horror. As they sat grouped about their spoil, in the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp, he viewed them with a detestation and disgust, which could hardly have been greater than the demons marketing the corpse itself. Let's see, uh, uh, two and carry the uh, uh, sort of thing there. Okay, uh, yes, that's your account, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. I always give too much to the ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself. That's your account. And if you ask me for another penny, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock on half a crown. This is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Spirit, I, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? He recoiled in terror for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed, on which beneath a ragged sheet there lay something covered up. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy. Though Scrooge glanced round it, anxious to know what kind of room it was, a pale light, rising in the outer air, fell straight upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. The spectre slowly pointed toward the body. Spirit, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. The spectre pointed toward the body. Oh, I understand you, and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, Spirit. I have not the power. Oh, Spirit, if there is any person in this town who feels emotion at all caused by this man's death, show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing, and withdrawing it, revealed a room by daylight, where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone, and with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, startled at every sound, looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, tried but in vain to work with her needle, and could hardly bear the voices of the children in their play. At length the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door, and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. There was a remarkable expression in it now, a kind of serious delight of which he felt ashamed, and which he struggled to repress. He sat down to the dinner that she had been boarding for him by the fire, and when she asked him faintly what news, which was not until after a long silence, he appeared embarrassed to answer, "'Is it good or bad?' 
bad. Oh, we are quite ruined. No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, there is. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. He is past relenting. He is dead. Dead? Oh, to whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But by that time, dear wife, we shall have the money. Spectre, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before, though at a different time he thought. Indeed the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on, as to the inn just now desired, until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. This course through which we hurry now is where my place of occupation is, and has been for a length of time. I see the house. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. The house is yonder. Why do you point away? Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom pointed as before. He joined it once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied it until they reached an iron gate. He paused to look round before entering. A churchyard. Here then the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation's death not life, choked up with too much burying fat with repleted appetite. A worthy place. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if preserved in, they must lead. Ha-ha! <laughs> but if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. Scrooge crept toward it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name. Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge. Spectre, am I the man that lay upon the bed? Oh no, spirit, oh no, no spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Oh, good spirit, your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. Oh, Spirit, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing on this stone! Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. I'm in my room. Oh, the, the curtains, the bed curtains, oh, they're not torn down. Oh, oh, what, what day is it? Oh, oh, the sun, the sun is shining and it's clear and it's bright. No fog. What a beautiful day. Oh, it's cold. Yeah, you there, down there, yes, you boy. What? Yeah. What's today? What's, What's that, that, sir? What's today, my fine fellow? 
Today? Why, Why it's Christmas, Christmas Day! day. <laughs> Christmas Day! Then I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. All in one night! Of course they can. Of course they can. They can do anything they like. Heaven be praised. How's that, sir? Listen, my lad, Dara. You know the poulterer in the next street? Oh, I, should I should say, say I, I do. do. <laughs> An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Tell me, do you know if they sold the prize turkey? The one that's hanging in the window? The big one, not the little one. What? The one, the one as big as me? me? <laughs> what a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, me buck. It's, it's hanging, hanging there now. now. That's wonderful. Go down. Tell him to send it to Bob Cratchit and his family on Broad Street. And mind you, they're not to know who paid for it. Go along. Hurry. Hurry, my lad. With, With what? what? Oh, yes. Yes. Here you go. And if you hurry, I shall give you... I shall give you half a crown for your trouble. What? Ha! And a Merry Christmas to you, boy. <laughs> oh, I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. <laughs> Merry Christmas! <laughs> Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas to, to everyone! everyone. And, a and a Happy, happy New, New Year, Year to, to the world! world. Merry Christmas to you. Glad tidings. Oh. Oh, my dear sir, how do you do? Oh, I beg your pardon. Sirs. Oh, Mr. Scrooge. Well, sir... Aren't you the gentleman who came to my office in regard to that charity yesterday? Why, uh, uh yes, sir. Well, a Merry Christmas to you. And, uh, if you'll allow me to ask your pardon, sir, and will you have the goodness to accept us? What? Lord bless me! My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please. Now, not a farthing less. <laughs> There's a great many back payments in there, I assure you. Well, would you do me that favor? Would you come and see me? Well, yes, my dear sir. Uh, I don't know what to say. Now, don't say anything, please. Come and see me. Please come and see me. We will. We will indeed. Thank you. I'm obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Good morning, sir. My dear, is your master at home? Yes, he's in the dining room along with mistress. Follow me, if you please. Oh, thank you, but I know the way. Fred, well, bless my soul, who is that? It is I, your, uh, your Uncle Scrooge. I've, uh, I've come to dinner if it's not too late. Not too late? No, Uncle, of course not. Oh, you're welcome here. Merry Christmas. Yes, sir. Merry Christmas. Oh, my dear, will you ever forgive a foolish old man? Speak nothing more of it. You're always welcome here, Uncle. Scrooge felt at home right away. Everything was exactly as he had seen. Wonderful food, wonderful friends, wonderful party. The next morning, Scrooge was early at his office. He went early for a reason. If he could only be there first and catch poor Bob Cratchit coming late, that is what he had his heart set upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine, but no Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him when he comes in. At last he came. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He was in his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Fifteen and twenty-six and twenty-four and twenty-two and thirty-nine. And... Hello, Bob Cratchit. Yes, sir. Step this way, Cratchit, if you please. Cratchit, what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? Why, I'm very sorry, sir. I, I'm behind me time. Yes, yes, you are. I think you are. Oh, it's only once a year, sir. Mr. Scrooge, it shall not be repeated. Well, we were making rather merry yesterday, sir. I'll tell you what, my friend. I'll not stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Bob Cratchit, and therefore, <laughs> I'm about to raise your salary. Mr. Scrooge, are you quite all right, sir? Merry Christmas, Bob. Merry Christmas, my good fellow. A merrier Christmas than I've given you in many a year. I shall raise your salary. And we'll see what we can do for Tiny Tim. 
Mr. Scrooge, have you lost your senses? No. Thank heaven, Bob. I've come to them. Merry Christmas, Bob. Merry Christmas, my good fellow. A merrier Christmas than I've given you in many a year. I shall raise your salary, and we shall see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the rest of your family. We will discuss it this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Now, make up the fire and buy another coal scuttle before you dart another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them. His own heart laughed, that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with the spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of us, all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, every one. Thank you.